All right. Uh, okay. And I'm a biologist at, uh, here at Edinburgh, uh, Centre for Systems and Synthetic, Synthetic Biology. Um, okay, so you all recognise this knot that we've got on the screen here, but you've probably not seen it in this form before. That is DNA under a, an electron microscope, and uh, that strand is about sort of 20 hydrogen atoms thick. Um, and I'm going to show you some enzymes. So. Enzyme number one is going to relax twists in DNA. Enzyme number two is going to do general and untangling of DNA. And enzyme number three is modification of DNA. And enzymes are really the way that you want to think about uh, DNA and knot theory. It's certainly the thing that uh, DNA and knot theory is sort of applied to understanding. Um, so, okay. What we've got here on the left is topoisomerase 1. This is an enzyme, and it's clasped to this piece of DNA here. Uh, what does it do? Well, we've got a little video of that. If we go to here. I'm assuming that you're all familiar with the f this representation of DNA. Two strands twisted around one another. Uh, topoisomerase 1 can come along. You'll see why it's called topoisomerase 1 in a bit. And it can break precisely one strand, put it back together, and it has relaxed one of the twists in the DNA, hmm. which is useful. And I'll show you why it's useful. This is a more, this is a different enzyme. This is not any of the enzymes that uh, you study with knot theory, but it's quite spectacular. Uh, if I can play it for you, yeah. Lights. one of the most important enzymes in the world there. And this is happening in your body all the time. Quite amazing. And it's sort of reproducing the DNA here. Don't, don't bother thinking about the details too much, but uh, yeah, very important thing. But what I want you to think about, and what the mathematicians might already have realized, is there's a bit of a problem with this thing over here. Do you see what it was doing? It was coming straight out of that, and it was sort of corkscrewing out. Um, the lights are fine now, okay. Um, you're familiar with this movement. You open up a bottle with a corkscrew. And what do you do in that situation? Well, you have to twist, turn your hand around, twist, turn your hand around, etc. You can't just twist, 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 twist. You have to let go, okay? And that is what you have topoisomerase 1 for, to relax twists in the DNA. Because otherwise, this thing, in addition to reproducing the DNA, would just twist it all up, which would be no good. And so the topoisomerase 1 does the job of this letting go, turning around, and grabbing again. OK, now topoisomerase 2. This is a different enzyme. Uh, if I go to this part, much bigger. Again, quite a simple mechanism there. It sees something like this, and it passes the two strands through each other. And if you've got DNA that's hugely tangled up, you can see why that would help you. Because I want you to think of DNA not as this sort of abstract thing that you might do if you hear about it in the news. Sort of you get your DNA from your parents or um, your cells reproduce the DNA. You're thinking about it abstractly there. DNA is a real thing that is inside of you, and it has tension, and it has bendability. It needs to be managed. Um, and I want you to imagine your little girl has gotten an ear infection. She's in a lot of pain. You take her to doctor. Doctor says she has got Moxarella catarrhalis, or whatever that is. Uh, doctor gives you. Ciprofloxacine, okay? This is a very common drug. And incidentally, she would have given you the same drug if your little daughter was presenting with bubonic plague, right? Very powerful antibiotic is ciprofloxacine. You give her the ciprofloxacine, she feels good, okay? Everybody's happy. Ciprofloxacine cures the bacterial infection. How did it do that? Well, it caused the bacteria's DNA to become so tangled up that the bacteria couldn't manage it anymore. It couldn't reproduce, and it went away. 
And here's what it looks like when it's doing that. The little green things here, those are the drug molecules. Okay? This is the DNA, obviously. And this big blue thing, that's topoisomerase 2. And what topoisomerase 2 is trying to do is it's trying to break open that DNA. But the little green things, the drug molecules, are stopping it from doing that. How's that for applied mathematics? Okay, and enzyme number three. No spectacular animations here, but essentially it can take two strands of DNA and it can swap which one is connected to which. It's kind of useful if, for example, let's say that this is your DNA in your body, telling your body what it looks like, and an extra piece of DNA comes along, and along comes... Uh, this enzyme that we're talking about here, tyrosine recombinase, name doesn't matter, but it swaps them over and you pull that tight and now you've got a new piece of DNA in your DNA. And this is a very politically important thing. You know, this is how we're curing diseases today. This is how we're making crops that mean that we don't uh, 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 die out. Um, yeah, this is, that is genetic modification. Um, okay, so there are some examples of uh, ways you can manage the topology of DNA with enzymes, but here's a general problem for you. How can you work out the function of an enzyme given some knots that it makes? This is, this is real biology. This is very important stuff that's going on every day uh, in labs all over the world. So you have a picture like this. It's very difficult to get pictures of these things, by the way. They are minuscule. Um, and that up there is a loop of DNA, and that thing there is TN3 resolvase. It doesn't really matter, but it's an enzyme. Uh, what is it doing to the DNA? We don't know, a priori. We don't know what the enzymes are doing. Um, and let's say that we've got some hypothesis. We're not sure whether it's true. We've got some hypothesis that uh, it will swap two ends around, but it needs to have two little loops here, or something like that. It doesn't matter, but this is the kind of thing that an enzyme might do, and this is the kind of thing that a biologist might speculate that an enzyme is going to do to some DNA. And we have some tools at our disposal. We have lots of these. This is just a loop of DNA, and you can have as many of these as you want. You can have millions and millions, and they can be twisted around into knots. Um, and you can take a load of those loops and you can put them into a test tube. Uh, and you can put it in there along with lots of your little TN3 result recombinase or whatever enzyme it is that you're trying to test. And we have this little experimental thing. Sorry, I might be going a bit over time, but it, this has connections to what Paul was talking about, I dare say. I'm um, going to speed this up for you. So this is a little experiment. What you're seeing here is some... Maybe take the lights off again, sorry. Maybe you can see this. So the, there are little dyes, and they're sort of being caused to wash across the medium. Um, and what's happening there is that negatively charged molecules are going to the right. Quite simply is how I'm going to summarise that. Um, lights back on again, sorry. Um, now let's say that you put your test tube full of loops of DNA and enzymes onto there. What will happen? Well, you'll get them moving over to the right, and you'll actually get them separating out a bit. Okay? That means that there's more than one kind of molecule in your test tube. So to clarify this again, you've taken a bunch of loops of DNA, you've taken a bunch of the enzyme that you're studying, you've mixed them up a whole lot, you've put them on this thing, and you've turned it on, and they've all separated out into a bunch of different kinds of molecules. And then this, new th this thing down here becomes your data, right? This is, the, this is the sets of different kinds of molecules that have gone in uh, to your solution. And it turns out that the amount over to the right that they move in that experiment is determined by the minimal crossing number which I understand to be a not theoretic thing. The mathematicians will tell me about this. Uh, how, how far separated they are is determined by their minimal crossing number, which is a not invariant. Okay, and you use not theory to take your hypothesis and you theoretically compute a bunch of possible knots that it can make. 
Um, this, these, these were in an actual paper, and uh, there's some general solutions for you. So they use knot theory to study this hypothesis. They compare the knots that they obtained uh, in their computation with the real knots, and you can tell whether your hypo hypothesis is true or not. And that is how that works. That's how you can use knot theory to study biology, maybe cure someone's ear infection, maybe stop someone from dying. In fact, almost certainly you will stop someone from dying. Okay, thank you. <laughs>